So let's work out this problem from the book by Neiman, um, chapter 5.8. Silicon semiconductor resistor is in the shape of a rectangular bar with a cross-sectional area given and the length also given and is doped with a concentration of 2 times 10 to the 16 uh, boron atoms per cubic centimeter at 300 Kelvin. 2 volts is applied across the length of the device. Calculate the current in the resistor. And then there's follow-up parts. Repeat part A if the length is increased by a factor of 3. And part C is determine the average drift velocity of holes in parts A and B. So I've taken a, a moment to circle the things which I think are important in the problem to help conceptualize it. The material is silicon. The shape uh, of the silicon is a rectangular bar. and We know the area and the length. We also know the doping concentration, 2 times 10 to the 16 boron atoms per cubic centimeter. The temperature, and it's hooked up to a 2-volt battery, a 2-volt power supply, which causes a current to flow. So as I drew this little sketch here, the 2 volts is applied between the left and the right side of that bar, causing a current to flow from right to left. Sorry, from left to right. And the target variable in this problem is that current I. What is the current in this semiconductor? So we're trying to determine the current. We know the voltage delta V applied across this semiconductor. Of course, the equation which relates the current so the voltage applied is Ohm's law, delta V is equal to I times R, and we know delta V, and we know that's 2 volts. The current is what we're trying to find, but we don't know the resistance. So now we have a new target variable, which is the resistance. We need to relate that to other things given in the problem. We need to relate R to the semiconductor properties and size. Right? Those are the things that we know about. So the equation that relates uh, R to material properties and size is the one R equals rho L over A, where rho is the resistivity, or you might write it in terms of conductivity L over sigma times A. And of course, now we know L and we know A. Those things are given. But now we don't know what sigma is. The last piece of information that we have in the problem, which we haven't used yet, is the doping. So now we need to relate the conductivity to the doping. Remember that doping, the whole point of doping is that it can make your material more conductive or more resistive, depending on how much doping you do. And so since we know the amount of doping that's been done here, we can relate that to the conductivity. The equation that we want to use is this one, E N0 mu N plus P0 mu P. So now we're getting there. Mu N and mu P we can look up. We know the mobilities of uh, electrons and holes in the material. And we know, if you look up here, boron atoms, boron is an acceptor. So we know that that number that's given there is Na, that uh, density of acceptor atoms. All right, look up. So we know that P0 is approximately equal to Na, which we know. So in fact, we know Na and we know P0. And typically, when you have doping like this, um, the doping is strong enough that one of these terms is bigger than the other. So we'll just neglect this first term because it's p-type. material. So the first term is going to be so small compared to the second one that we don't need to worry about it and we'll make our lives easier. So I think now we have this chain 
starting from the bottom, we can get sigma. Sigma allows us to get R, and then R allows us to get the current. Moving into our planning stage now, we have basically all of the relevant information in front of us. Let's just make this a little bit more explicit. We've got basically three equations down here. So our plan is going to be to start with substitute 3 into 2. So our formula for sigma goes into 2. And then we substitute uh, 2 up into 1 and solve for the current. So now we just have to carry through this algebra in order to get our final solution. So let's do it. Substituting equation 3 into equation 2, we have r equals to L over sigma, and sigma is E P0 mu P, but P0 is approximately equal to Na mu P times A. So we took this guy here and put it in for sigma. Now we have to substitute that up into the Ohm's law equation. So we have I equals delta V divided by R. And then I substitute in for R. Delta V divided by that whole thing L over E Na mu P times A. And let's simplify this a little bit. I equals, we can, dividing by a fraction, so we're going to have here delta V, E, N, A, mu P, times A, divided by L. And we've got there now a final formula with all of the things we know in it, or things we can look up. And so the problem is solved now except for plugging in the numbers. So I just copied the final formula which we had on the previous slide. have to plug numbers into this. All of the numbers are given uh, except for mu p. So remember this is silicon. This is the table that's on the equation sheet. Silicon and you've got here the mobility in these units uh, for holes is 480. So we have to look up that value. Everything else is given in the problem. Now I'll ask you to uh, go ahead and plug the numbers into this. And I'll pause the narration so I can do it a little bit quickly. And uh, pay attention to the units. Very easy to get tripped up by units here. So I'm going to make sure that I'm very careful with units when I'm plugging numbers into this equation. When solving problems in solid state physics, I usually like to use not SI units. So I always provide my length um, distances in centimeters. Um, I try to use volts whenever possible. And I keep my charge in units of E. This typically simplifies the kind of conversion problem. So I've done that here. I put in volts. Everything is in centimeters. I didn't do any conversions. And I kept my E just in units of E like that. So let's see what comes out of this when we check the units. But now we just have to plug these numbers into our calculator and, and we're finished. But before we do that, let's make sure that uh, what we have makes sense. So as always, let's check the units. What do we have here? On the top, we've got a volts and there's a volts on the bottom, so those guys cancel. We've got an E sitting out front, and then the rest is all centimeters. So let's check all of those units. So the units of I, I've got an E on the top, 
and then let's count centimeters. I've got centimeters squared, centimeters squared, centimeter to the minus three. So that's four minus three centimeter on the top. I've got a one over seconds sitting there. Sorry, I forgot about the seconds. And then I've got a centimeter on the bottom, centimeter. And these cancel. So the units that I get out of this are E per second, which is a unit of current, it's charge per second, but it's not amps, so if we want to convert it to amps, we need to multiply by the charge of E. But at least we have the right units, so the units are okay. And now let's plug in the numbers and see if we get something reasonable. When I plug it in, I get 2.176 times 10 to the 17, and remember the units are E per second. So intuition-wise, it's a little bit hard because remember these units, that's the number of electrons flowing per second. An electron is really small, so a big number seems okay. If you convert it to amps, I have 1.6 um, times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs per E, and then these guys cancel out and I get 34.8 milliamps, which is a reasonable current. I mean, you can see that in a uh, sort of everyday sized piece of material. If it was 10 to the 10 amps, that should give you some pause because those currents don't you never see. And if it's 10 to the minus 10 amps, that would, would also give you pause that you probably made a mistake somewhere. So this seems reasonable, it's a reasonable number. We checked the units, so the units are good. So this is our answer to part A. Let's move on to part B now. Part B, pretty simple. Repeat the part A if the length is increased by a factor of three. So this is the whole reason to solve the problem algebraically. We have this formula, this nice formula, which is sitting right here. And so now all I have to do is look at that formula and plug different numbers into it. I don't have to resolve the problem. I can just use this uh, formula. And you can see that the L is in the denominator there. So if the length goes up by a factor of three, the current's gonna go down by a factor of three. So I is proportional to one over L. So uh, my I initial is gonna be proportion proportional to one over L initial. I final is going to be proportional to 1 over L final, which is when up by a factor of 3, which means that my final current is my initial current divided by 3. And so you can just take 34.8 milliamps divided by 3, and it's 11.6 milliamps. So very simply, I can solve this part B without doing hardly any work because of all the work we did in part A. It's worth taking a second to see whether this makes sense to you. Um, why does the current go down? As I make the material longer, I'm increasing the resistance. It's sort of like trying to push more current. I think of it like water, trying to push a lot of water through a longer pipe. Uh, has larger resistance, especially if the pipe has kind of uh, rocks or something in it. The longer it is, the more rocks there are, the harder it is to push water through, so the resistance goes up. If the resistance goes up, the current's got to go down. So at least makes sense um, the way that it changed. Let's move on to part C now, where we have a new target variable. Determine the average drift velocity of the holes in parts A and B. So on our diagram, remember that this current goes along, there's holes that are moving along this bar with some speed, which we call VD, and that's what we're after now. So we need to relate the velocity to the other things that we have in the problem. So how is velocity related to current? Well, one approach that I could think about would be to use this formula. I is equal to number density of charge carriers 
E A V D. Just be careful because this uh, is charge carriers. So in this case, uh, number density of charge carriers, this should be uh, P0, right? which we know is approximately equal to Na. So in fact, I know everything in this formula. I know uh, the current from the previous parts. I know this. I know E. I know A. I can get the drift velocity. Let me also do approach two. Here's another way you could think about it. I could relate the velocity of charges to the mobility. So remember that um, mobility mu p is equal to uh, the velocity divided by the electric field, which is being applied. Now that seems worse because I don't know the electric field, but I also know the voltage, right? So there's an electric field being applied in here, like here, which causes those charges to move. And I know there's a relationship between the voltage applied, delta V, is equal to the magnitude of the electric field times the distance over which that electric field is applied, which in this case is L. So my electric field is, is acting over the horizontal distance of L, and that leads me to my voltage. So I can get here mu p is equal to vd divided by delta v times l on the top. So I've got two approaches here. Now I know mu p, I know l, I know delta v. So I've got two formulas um, which I can use uh, to calculate the drift velocity. Both of these formulas will give us the same answer. I'm going to use the second one. So let's um, plug in the numbers. First, let's solve VD. So I'm using the second approach here. And then you can check that if you use the first approach, you'll still get the same answer. VD is going to be mu p times the voltage difference delta v divided by L. Now let's plug in the numbers, 480 centimeters squared per volts times seconds times 2 volts divided by L, which is 0 0.075 centimeters. And what I get out of this is 12,800. And checking the units, I've got volts on the bottom, volts on the top. A centimeter squared on the top and a centimeter on the bottom so I'm left with units of centimeters per second which is 128 meters per second that's pretty fast I was a bit surprised by this number typically the velocities of electrons in a, a conducting materials are smaller than this but it's highly highly doped silicon so um, uh, we we can accept this answer and another way to check it of course is to use the second way or approach one and if you check that uh, if you do approach one you use this what appears to be a different approach you get the same answer which gives you even more confidence so uh, I think we're good and that's the solution to part C so there's a example of using conductivity, resistivity, relating it to doping, and also finding the drift velocity of electrons. And hopefully you found this to be a useful problem to study.